And uh, now we have on stage Wojtek from Inkuvo talking about bringing dreams come true. So take it away, Wojtek. Hi, everybody. All right. How are you guys today? All good? Not so good, I see. All right. Uh, because I'm from the demo scene, the first slide should look like this, not like that before, probably. Uh, okay, I'm going to tell you about how I came the way from demo scene to making video games on a kind of big scale. How can you do that also by yourself and what helps, what doesn't. Uh, so, it all started like, a, I think it was 25 years ago or something like that. My first computer was Atari, but because later I had Amiga, we need to say, uh, let's forget about it, because there is only one computer that exists. So my real first computer was ZX Spectrum then. Uh, maybe some uh, of you had this machine or at least know about it. It was a very lovable computer. Uh, as a small kid, I loved playing games. I had like literally hundreds of them for my Spectrum. Uh, in Poland at the time, piracy was totally legal. You can pirate games to your heart's content. That was legal according to law. So I had like hundreds of games for it. Uh, I loved playing games so much that I wanted to create them. So I asked my brother, I begged him, please teach me how to program. And he did that. I was like eight years old. I learned how to program in basic and I did my first game. And it was so cool to show it to my friends and see them actually play it. Uh, Spectrum was a very cool little machine, uh, but it had its very, uh, you know, naughty limitations. Like in every block of, uh, I think it was eight by eight or something pixels, uh, you could have only two colors. So here you go how the graphics looked. They were very blocky. But then people figure out you can sometimes do something that is Theoretically not possible, that is not within the limitations of the hardware. And they figure out that actually on Spectrum you can make the graphics better. Uh, you can see the difference on the uh, Parrot's uh, nose, face, and here it's better now. A bit better, but better. Uh, what happened here was that with every line they changed the palette of colors, and then it was possible to have a blocks of 8 by 1 pixel of two colors, not 8 by 8 pixels. So it turned out the machine can do something that's theoretically impossible. And that later on was the foundation of a demo scene, I mean, pushing hardware to the limits. Uh, this uh, let people express themselves in new ways. I mean, if you can do something other people cannot do, it's a way of showing a technical skill and a way of s uh, making people say, wow, how did that happen? Uh, a bit later, I became a proud owner of Amiga 500. Uh, this was the machine of uh, my dreams and the dreams of many, many people at the time. Uh, it had really cool graphics. Uh, if you compare it to a PC or other computers at the time, they were like uh, nothing compared to Amiga. Uh, and the very same monitor. I didn't have this disk drive, but the mouse. I, I still have uh, Amiga 1200 somewhere in my uh, home. I just need to uh, uh, refurbish it one day and bring it back to life. So with Amiga, there came a bunch of very, very cool software. Uh, one of the programs, anybody recognize this? Yeah? Just give the name. Yeah, exactly. It was Dalax Pint. I think, I think it's version 3, but I don't know it for sure. Uh, it was one of the first programs that I launched at my Amiga. It was so cool. You could paint everything if you had the skill. That's not my picture. Uh, and it make the creativity really boost on Amiga. The palette of colors was limited. There were, Amiga could display 32 colors or 64 in some more advanced uh, extra half bright mode, but then the latest uh, 32 were just half the brightness of the first 32, so we had only control of the first half of the palette. And there was the mode core Ham and modify, which uh, hold and modify, which uh, enabled you to display 4,000 colors on screen. But it was very difficult to find in this mode. So Dalex Paint was so cool. Uh, 
with a software like this, people were able to create some really, really great games. Uh, at that time, it was, you know, like mind-blowing. Anybody recognize this game? Yeah? Sorry? Yeah, Shadow of the Beast 2, exactly, that's the point. That was the second part of the game. Uh, if you notice the rainbow of colors in the background, it was possible only because of the hardware tricks, changing a single color which uh, every couple of lines so that it created a gradient. It was one of the very few uh, effects that was quite easily achievable on the Amiga and made the game look as it used more colors that Amiga could really uh, technically use. Uh, there were many, many more really inspiring games on the Amiga. Uh, so that was Shadow of the Beast, and uh, then with the graphics, with the games, with everything that was shown, there was also, of course, the demo scene. Uh, and now I'm going to show you a demo. Whoever raises his hand first and gives the correct answer win wins a t-shirt. Uh, so uh, try your best. I'll try to judge who was first and tell the name of the demo. Okay, the t-shirt probably will stay, but you can give a... Uh, wild guesses at it. All right, nobody. Uh, it was one of the most classic demos ever made, hardwired. Uh, back then, it was really mega inspiring. And moreover, it was one of the demos that showed that it's not only about technical skills. It was also about the story and about telling people something. So it was kind of closer to what we call art normally. Uh, all those things, the Oxpine, the graphics, the music, there were various programs to create great music, the trackers, various trackers, uh, the games, the demo scene, it was all about emotions, about expressing yourself, showing your emotions, and raising some emotions in your audience so that people get excited, angry, uh, happy, whatever, but they get some emotions out of you. Uh, maybe you heard of this story, but uh, this guy, you probably know him better than me, <laughs> Albert Einstein, uh, he once had a speech like I'm having today, but when he came to the stage, he uh, saw that all the audience was old ladies. And he thought to himself, if I just tell them about the general relativity laws, they are going to probably sleep uh, by the end of my speech. So he did something totally else. He uh, took out his violin and played a concerto. The result, imagine those ladies. They came to listen to the most, world most famous uh, physicists, and they have a concerto played by him on violin. So they had a great experience. They had a really high emotions out of it. So this is how you should think about your audience as a game creator, as a demo creator, as whoever you are. Make best impression. Bring emotions to people. Don't bore them down. Don't let them sleep. Don't show what you are best at. Show what they want to see. Uh, later on, I joined some groups uh, starting from probably totally unknown, like GBS Convex up to Zone 51 and uh, Amnesty later on. Uh, in Poland, uh, when we had a demo scene parties, it was real, really about partying, and partying hard usually. Uh, in Poland, the demo scene came from a bit different tradition, as I told you before today. The piracy was totally okay. I mean, you could just copy games to whatever you wanted. You could charge for copying games. So people organized so-called copy parties. We came together to places and copied games, software, demos, whatever. And yes, when demos came to copy parties, a scene has been built. Uh, and there, uh, therefore, those parties were called copy parties at the beginning in our country. Only later on, they became uh, known as demo parties. Uh, in that part of Europe, the party started right in the train when the uh, when we're traveling to, to the party. Uh, then, and you can see, uh, the party places were all about, you know, uh, uh, crazy people doing crazy stuff, sleeping everywhere, uh, doing demos during the parties, like hundreds of people. And then eventually, very tired after the experience, we came back home uh, after showing the demos, after showing the graphics, after sharing our own emotions. So it was 
very social socialized event. Uh, today, the event here is great. Uh, I see a lot of socialization. The times have changed a bit. We tend to sit more at the computers, less at the desks. As you can see, not ma very uh, many computers were there on the desks. People tend to speak to each other. I encourage you to stand up later on and just uh, you know, uh, talk to people. Uh, a demo scene and demo group was about a team that you could trust, so a bunch of people who came together said to themselves, come on, we can create a demo, and it can be really great. Uh, so you could trust each other. If somebody told you I'm going to deliver you the graphics tomorrow, you probably would have the graphics, or at least, at least that person explaining, sorry, I was busy yesterday, I had school, whatever. Uh, it was about stories to tell. Those stories were, were very simple sometimes. Sometimes there were more, you know, fully fledged, but it was about stories. Uh, it was about devoting yourself, spending nights coding the demos, spending nights sending them on disks to friends, no internet at the beginning of demo scene. And it was also about technical skills, so making your production stand out of the competition and showing, wow, that's impossible on the... Uh, you know, this uh, machine. Uh, and creating a demo was kind of like similar to creating a game in a small team. I mean, everybody was like, let's do it, like, you know, totally, we can do it. We got an idea. It's our demo, it's our game. Uh, what documentation? We, we don't have time for documentation. Same in small game studios. We don't do documentation. We, we just do the games. Uh, a bit of chaos never hurts. You know, nobody was a manager in a demo group. Uh, you rarely see, uh, you know, fully fledged management in small game studios. Although there is a, a little bit of management that is needed if you do a, a game. Uh, sleep is for the weak people. I mean, uh, there were nights to be had working at computers sleeping very little, getting up early, staying up till night because the deadline was there. The same happens when you do a game. There is a deadline, you want to release it. There is a publisher or not. You need to stay late at night. The first big difference, and the only one I'm going to show here, is uh, with the demo scene, you couldn't get a filthy reach. Uh, not really. With the games, maybe, some of us. But that's still not the reason for most of us to create games. Uh, and that's good, because it should be about emotions. It should be about showing your stories. The money comes if you are good and if you have hit the sweet spot on the market, but you shouldn't take the money as uh, you know, uh, your uh, main concern, because then you probably are going to end up like some of the companies like Zynga did, and you don't want to do that. Uh, the one huge difference between games and Demo scene, games and movies, games and music, games and any kind of other art is interactivity. Because in games, player co-creates the experience of playing. I mean, when you create a movie, when you create a music album, when you create a demo, you are giving a you know, finished piece of art. Somebody watches it, listens to it, can stop watching, stop listening, but he cannot change your album. M maybe yes, he can do remixes, but that's another story. With the game, the player interacts with your games, so he co-creates the whole experience all the time. That, that makes the games really different and really more difficult to uh, plan for. Uh, it just happened in my life later on that I wanted to create games, but the life led me to becoming a normal uh, computer programmer, so I spent time uh, programming some IT uh, stuff. That was also a kind of a good experience because I learned uh, how to program and uh, how to work in a, you know, company in some formal structures and do stuff. But one day I realized, uh, you know, something was wrong with this. Uh, I mean, okay, that's good, I get money, I can leave, but, but that's not what I wanted to do. Like, uh, yeah, I had a great, great experience. And uh, if you're a programmer doing part of your life, doing just, let's say, boring business stuff, that's perfectly okay because you'll learn a lot. You'll become a better programmer because you'll become a, your code will become more clear. Uh, you'll learn how to work in uh, some you know fixed environment, 
but uh, eventually, probably, if you are after games, you will want to create your own studio, and that's what happened here. We created a studio called Fresh Chicken Studio. I co-founded it with my friend Jakub, uh, who was not a demo scene uh, guy. He came from the business, actually. Uh, it was 2005. Uh, the name was funny when we showed this to investors and some boring business partners. We used just the FCS. We didn't show we are called Fresh Chicken Studio. One day we got this call from Ukraine with some guy asking us if he want to uh, buy like three tons of chicken stuffing. You know, the stuff that you put inside of chickens to uh, make them tasty. We didn't buy that. I wonder if that was a good idea not to buy it. But, well, now the deal is not more possible anymore. Uh, and we hired a lot of demo scene guys to that company. Why was that so? Uh, because we needed technical skills. We wanted to make uh, games that deliver really the, you know, technical, uh, on the technical level. We wanted to focus on emotions. As, as I told you before, demos, art are about emotions. So games are about emotions. So we want to have people who know what is giving emotion through your production. Uh, on a demo scene, we work in an interdisciplinary teams. And that was also cool, because uh, when you take a guy who was, for example, only an artist in some you know, um, uh, media company or a programmer from IT, he probably worked only with programmers. The guy from the, art, uh, the media company worked only with artists. And that's not good, because you know, in a real game uh, environment, people, uh, programmers work with uh, artists, uh, with uh, producers, with uh, designers with musicians, they sit all in one room and they need to interact and talk to each other. That, that's what was happening at the demo scene. Uh, and basically at demo scene we laugh what we do. And laugh is much needed when you do games because when you laugh what you do, what you produce is really great. Uh, our first uh, real game was a mini RC rally. It was released on Nintendo DS. Uh, what I'm especially proud about is that we we're a totally remote team. We didn't have even an office. We had one programmer in Australia, one in the US, and the rest of the team was in Europe. So if uh, the guy in Australia uh, woke up, uh, we went to bed, and when we woke up, the guy in the uh, US uh, woke up or something like that. It was totally crazy, and we managed to do a game that was sold on retail shelves for Nintendo DS. Moreover, we managed to... You know, today Nintendo gives accreditation to most of the indie teams that want to. But back then you had to prove you are an established company and that you have done already a game for Nintendo. That was preferred. Uh, how do you, could you do a game for a Nintendo if you couldn't do it because you were not accredited to do so? So it was kind of vicious circle. But we managed to get the accreditation. We became an official Nintendo developer having no office. Uh, I gave a number to my brother uh, as an office number. I told him if somebody from Nintendo calls, just pretend this is a big office and boss is out of office. And it worked. Uh, you know what? We're kind of proud of what we did because this was uh, early days of Nintendo DS. We had one of the first Nintendo DS dev kits in Europe. Uh, we did a 3D on both screens. Initially, it was said it's not possible on DS. We did it. Uh, but the problem was the game sucked, and sucked a lot. Uh, we learned our lessons. We learned that you need to start with the fun in mind, not with the technology in mind. Technologically wise, it was great. Uh, by the way, the fact that it was technologically great uh, became uh, our main strength because the engine that we have built along the road and Rafa is going to tell you a bit about engines later today. He was one of the authors, and he laid the whole foundation for the engine. That engine was really something back then. Uh, back then, it was a good idea because there were no engines for 3DS. So it was a good idea to bring out your own engine. Uh, we improved on our game portfolio. Uh, sadly, we improved with mostly games that weren't released later because we tend to uh, get into cooperation with uh, publishers that eventu eventually went bankrupt. All that was left were, were some game demos. But that was great. The demos were needed at a later stage when we came to other studios saying, hey guys, we did this before. And those games looked better, played so much better. 
uh, that was right over the river, a very cool uh, sci-fi vertical shooter for the 3DS. Very sad that it was not finished. Uh, then there was this double blobs game. A really neat idea of those blobs were bouncing off the screen. Uh, you were shooting in them. There was a crazy multiplayer mode in which one player was at the bottom of the screen and the other was upside down on the top of the screen. Sadly, it was also unreleased. Uh, by the way, when I was looking, uh, I didn't have screenshots for the second game in my archive. That's one thing. If you do anything, save screenshots, because later on it might be difficult to find them. Uh, I searched internet for the term double blobs. That's what I got. Uh, so, uh, but that's not the game with it, just in case you'll be checking that uh, out. Uh, eventually, Fresh Chicken Studio was sold to sit interactive games mainly because of the engine, and secondly, because of the game demo portfolios that we uh, could uh, build up. Uh, City Interactive Games is uh, Poland's one of the biggest uh, publisher and game developers, guys from the Sniper game. Uh, under that brand, uh, we build a studio of almost 40 people, uh, and that was uh, built constantly from like uh, we started as a team of seven and built it up to 40 people in a semi independent uh, branch of City Interactive Games. We released games for Nintendo DS, for PS3, uh, Xbox, Nintendo Wii. Uh, more than 15 titles along the road, uh, various genres, and that was also a very nice experience to be had. Uh, I mean, you know, working in a bigger company, seeing how all the distribution channels work, seeing how you work in a big studio, how you lead it. Me and Jakub, we lead the whole studio of 40 people. But eventually, it just came so after four years that we have learned, uh, well, we are kind of in a corporation now. I mean, uh, here is a studio of 40, there are 100 people. That's cool, but games are not about corporate. Uh, there is a great experience to be had, don't get me wrong, if you get to work along your way at, uh, you know, uh, uh, Epic Games or Ubisoft or Electronic Arts or whatever, that's cool. That's very cool, you'll hone your skills, you'll get a great experience, but at one point you'll probably get a bit bored because it will be only this little, you know, girl in a big machine. Uh, so eventually we wanted to do something new and that was the time that we really thought about what to do next and uh, how to build our uh, next company. And we just thought, you know, uh, me and as, as a kid, I love playing games. That hasn't changed really. No. Uh, kids still love playing games. Most of us do. If you look at the, you know, big hole here, everybody's playing something. We love playing games. And uh, it just happens so that you, if you really enjoy something, you probably want to engage deeper. Maybe you want to become a creator, try how is it to you know, create a game by yourself. And that's kind of a problem, because uh, if you love photos, you got Instagram. You don't have any skills, but you can you know, take a photo, apply filter, send it out at the bank, you're a photographer. Uh, if you want to make some music, there are some very cool music applications. Uh, uh, I love the proper propeller heads uh, synthesizer. I don't remember the name, but I'm going to give you because it's really a uh, figure for the uh, iPhone. That's great. I cannot make music, but with this, I love some electronic sounds that I can create. Uh, well, there is even a crazy application. If you like uh, pottery, you know, there is a virtual pottery application called Let's Create Pottery. Our friends did it, and it's selling really well. So. Various kind of hobbies, and you get a lot of creative apps that sell li really big numbers. But there is no easy-to-use mobile game creation app. For PlayStation, we have Little Big Planet, but that's that's really great game. I love it. But it's only for PlayStation, and it's a bit difficult to use still. I spent three hours doing a small platformer there, and you know it didn't look like something that I would show you today here. And that's, that's the main problem. And still though, the game sold like 12 million copies or something, and uh, more than 23% of players have created and shared with the internet at least one level. That's crazy. I mean, uh, people really loved it. And uh, we, 
we just thought two years ago, what if you could create your own Angry Birds-like game or your own Mario game right there on your mobile device with no skill, because you know, probably you're not a game developer. And how would it be? If it looked cool, played well, that's uh, why we came with uh, our next business idea criteria. We had uh, some uh, assumptions that we wanted to be true. This was a product not intended for game developers, not for guys like me, not for probably some of guys like you. It was intended for a normal guys who don't know nothing about games and creating, how, do you, how we create games. So the game creation had to be fun and easy. Like no single line of scripting or coding or not even parameter setting. No technical skills required. Impressive visuals, great gameplay. You know what? People cannot do graphics. People cannot do art on average. Some can, but those who can probably do real games. If you cannot do that, you, are, you want to do that. So you, we want to provide you with the graphics so that you don't have to draw them yourself. Uh, and of course, the ability to share your creations, because probably you are not only going to do that for yourself. All this happens out on mobile devices. And uh, two years ago, we had no prototype. We had PowerPoint only, PowerPoint presentation. Actually, it was Keynote on Mac, not PowerPoint. And uh, you know what? We raised $1 million for the project, having no prototype. So how the hell do you do that? I mean, come on. Uh, first of all, you need a good idea. That's basic stuff and that's obvious. Uh, but a good idea that is uh, covering some unsolved problem that exists. Unsolved problem that exists uh, sorry, uh, means uh, there is some kind of niche on the market or area that is not really well covered. In our case, that was observation. There is no game that allows you to create your own games in a really easy way. Either they required you to create your graphics, or they required you to program, or the game looks shitty, simply shitty, or a lot of things happened, and usually it was all together. I mean, they required graphics, coding, and it always looked shitty at the end. Uh, and people are creative. There are various applications that I told you that show that. But if you are creating 25th copy of Angry Birds, 47 8th copy of Halo that wouldn't look even close to Halo, or your 5,782 attempt at recreating your own Fallout, there is only tiny chance you will succeed, and there is only very tiny chance anybody will turn their heads at. That includes also players, because imagine yourself. You got Fallout. Why would you play some really crappy Fallout? You wouldn't. You don't have infinite time in your life. And getting, you know, RPG game to the level that somebody wants to play it is a really hard task. I don't say it's impossible. I don't say you cannot succeed. But it's a really difficult situation. And still, I'm not talking only about money. I'm talking about customer satisfaction, about player satisfaction. You want your players to be satisfied, not yourself to say, yeah, I created an RPG. That's, you know, only you who created it and you satisfied maybe your mom, and that's it. Uh, third thing that was told yesterday, definitely during the uh, VC presentation, your solution, your team, you as a founder, you should be scalable. Scalable means you can grow. There is place for growth. Uh, uh, hardly scalable businesses are those who are not in an electronic area when you have to physically ship something, physically produce. If Apple needs to produce uh, more iPhones or, uh, I don't know, Samsung new uh, galaxies, they need you know, to build more or hire more factories, more people. That's difficult. If you have a great, successful game and you want to sell twice the number of copies, you just sit back, relax, and wait for them to be sold because uh, somebody handles the operation for you. If you have a server backend, the situation gets more tricky because you got more server uh, load, more people use your application, your game, and you probably need to be careful with that. But basically, those uh, 
applications that happen now in the digital market, they are very scalable because usually there is no barrier in selling 10 times the number of copies that you are selling today. Uh, experience in previous projects, portfolio, whether commercial, uncommercial, demos, uh, fan-made mods. You probably heard of this guy who made a huge Skyrim mod recently. I think he'll get a job. Maybe not at Bethesda, but somewhere definitely. Uh, that's something. And you don't have to spend your life doing your portfolio. You just need to really do it. I see a lot of people sending you know, CVs telling, I want to be an artist, I want to be a programmer. And I did nothing, I just want. So if you want, go ahead. Spend your time doing what you want to do and show it to somebody. Uh, strong team. I mean, it's uh, not only about you, but also about uh, having a team of people like you. And uh, good advice, if you one day become a boss of a company, Look around the guys around you. If they are better than you, better than you, that means you hired the right people, you are working with the right people. If they are worse than you, it means you hired the wrong people. Because you always need to hire people who are better than you at the jobs they do. Yes, you should be better at something, but in general, at the whole game, your team needs to be as, as good as possible. And the last thing is you need to show that you love what you do. The investors really look into your attitude towards your product. If you are like, ah, yeah, you know, I just want to get filthy rich and buy a Ferrari. Uh, okay, maybe you'll get a filthy rich and maybe you'll buy a Ferrari, but that shouldn't be the reason behind what you do. Uh, or you say, you know, I just want to make a super cool game and uh, show off to friends. Good, but that's not... Uh, what should be uh, behind all this. So, some tips on uh, how to start your journey towards uh, having a you know, game dev studio or at least a game dev team. Uh, first, with uh, this kind of project, you need a team and you need to learn. Probably some people you know and you can you know, come together and do something, but Probably you need more people. Uh, that's why it's good to go to all kinds of meetups and events like this, also smaller ones. If there are no events at your area, try to organize. It's not impossible. Even 20 people do, and sometimes you will meet uh, somebody who is a great artist, and you need an artist, and you will work together from then on. Uh, there are hackathons from time to time. That's also a very good place to uh, try to meet people. Also, exchange experience. I mean. Uh, you know, what engine are you using? Oh, we are using this and that. What's your experience? How did you get that license? Uh, how did you get your dev kits? Did you pay for that? No, they gave it to us for free. So how did you get that? Uh, yesterday, uh, our friends in San Francisco, they managed to get uh, one Microsoft Surface and one Nintendo dev kit for free. Uh, so it's, it's definitely possible. Uh, there are incubators. You got a, or accelerators. Incubator is for a, early stage company that's only starting. Accelerator is usually for a company that has started and wants to go faster along the road. You got a meetup, meetup sauna, uh, sorry, a startup sauna here. That's a very, very good uh, uh, place to be, but usually at those kind of places there is selection. You cannot just say, hi, I want to be here. They, they, you, you need them to want you there. So that's uh, a, a good place uh, to be. And uh, co-working spaces. I mean, all the modern offices <clears throat> that look kind of like this uh, corridor, you know, no walls, and not only your company sitting desk to desk, but another company sitting at the de desk next to you. <clears throat> we were at the, one of the most famous uh, co-working space called uh, Rocket Space in San Francisco, and, you know, just some unknown company sits, or almost unknown, desk to desk with the guys from Dropbox. And that's cool because they drink coffee together, they share experiences together, that's good for everybody. So co-working co spaces is something that you definitely want to look into. There you can find people, there you can share experience. That's for a stage when you have a team and you want to start working somewhere. Uh, if you have this and want to start working somewhere, you probably want to have some money for that. That's more difficult part. The best you can do but no, not everybody can afford that. It's uh, so-called bootstrapping. It means you got money from some other resources, like you have a second job, or you have a family that supports you, or you got a really rich friend that supports you. 
but that's the best way to do because then you use your own money for leaving or funding your company and that mean, means you are not selling yet to anybody. And remember one thing, the later you sell, the more money you are going to get out of it. Because as I said, you don't start with money in mind as a, you know, your target, but you need to think about it. Eventually, at one point, you want this probably to be a good business. And if that happens and you got a great game, good business, worldwide success, then why not have the money? So remember, if you are thinking about your future as a, some kind of a bigger studio, think about doing as much as you can before you go talk to any kind of you know, uh, VC and stuff like that. The later you go, the better for you. So bootstrapping, finding another job, like you know, uh, doing whatever you want, it cannot, can be totally unrelated to, to game development. Finding some money, finding help from your family. If you are young, you don't need much. Uh, you just need computer, something to eat, place to sleep, and that's all. Uh, some friends, and, and that's enough, so that's a very good idea. Uh, the next step is uh, angel investors. In Europe, it's hard to achieve because in Europe, the angel investors are very few. Those are the rich guys that are still guys, not big companies, that you know, look for companies that are promising and give them money. Uh, in the USA, it's a very common way of achieving uh, initial funding. In the USA, you can get up to, let's say, half a million dollars this way. And uh, if you collect from various people, you can even stack up a couple of millions uh, from angels only, not even talking to VCs. And angels are definitely uh, easier to work with because they are not big companies. They don't have such big you know, strategies in mind. They are not such, you know, hard pushers. Uh, they are just people. You can talk to them, and uh, it's good to have angels. But as I said before, in Europe, it's very difficult. So probably what's going to happen in Europe, you probably will start directly with the VCs. VCs are also a very good choice. Those are uh, venture capital funds. They'll give you money. There are institutions, uh, groups of people. Uh, the VC uh, that you saw yesterday, very good guys. I wish all VCs were like that because you see there are people that you can talk to. They have some good strategy. They don't only see everything in numbers. Yes, for them, numbers are very important, but they also look at different things, uh, different other things. Uh, VCs are also a good idea. Actually, in our case, because we are from Europe, from Poland, we started with VCs and we are funded by a uh, business accelerator and VC fund. That's that's how we raised money. Uh, if we could, we would use angels and bootstrapping, but that wasn't uh, possible at the time. Bootstrapping was not possible because we didn't have time, and uh, angels were not kind of possible at our scale in Europe. And the uh, last tip that I'm going to give you is like uh, go to San Francisco. And uh, it's not a joke. I really mean it. I find a way to get there. Uh, the startup sauna sent some of the teams to California. Uh, but generally, the problem is we are living here in Europe. It's a very good place to live. Uh, I, I, I probably won't be changing that in my life, but we'll see. Uh, but then the whole industry, the whole business works best in the US and especially in California. And San Francisco is totally different than the rest of the United States. It's closely related to what happens in Europe. Uh, People think differently. The guys like you who just start their business, who just start doing games, they kind of think differently. It's great to get there and see how people work there, how the transfer of knowledge happens. You can go to a meeting there, meet a senior manager of YouTube who probably earns a gazillion of dollars, have a chat with him, drink a beer with him, and talk to him like a normal guy without you know, being introduced or anything. That's what happens during all the events in, the, in uh, uh, California, in San Francisco. And there are tens of events like this every week. And you can just walk in, maybe pay 10 bucks for entrance, and go there. Uh, if you don't have you know, a lot of money, just remember there are places in San Francisco or area to stay for uh, really cheap rates. Look for uh, uh, houses or villas that are shared by students or young people. Uh, there is coach sur surfing uh, so that you will sleep at random people places. Uh, so there are ways to be there. 
visit some events, go to some studios, there is a great chance they will let you in and you know it's like, oh, Electronic Arts is in this building, Twitter is there, Facebook right behind me, and uh, I'm right now standing under Microsoft uh, offices. So everything is in the vicinity, so we just walk from company to company and see how it works. And that's, uh, that's something really great. Uh, there is a game accelerator called Yetizen in the United States, you can check them out. It's also a place, if you have a game, if you have a, an idea, if you have a studio, it might be worth talking to them if you want to learn something about Yetizen. We've been there for three months. Uh, I can tell you how it worked. We learned a lot from there. So uh, that's kind of like a great experience, I believe. Uh, now I'm gonna show you uh, just five minutes of uh, how Criteria turned out to be after this year of work because right now we are about to release it on uh, the market. We are currently in Apple uh, review uh, now. Okay, so uh, as I told you, this is a game uh, for normal people, not for game developers. So everything that's gonna happen must be extremely simple. As you can see, uh, we try to be eye candy from the uh, very beginning, let me try to uh, create a simple level. We can start with a totally empty level, that's fine, but you can also use a template, so the level is almost uh, ready out there for you. And look, it looks kind of good even being empty. Compare that to empty Unity layout. You got uh, hundreds of windows, options, and everything. And here is a beautiful landscape. Uh, if you want to paint some terrain, you select the painting terrain tool and do it like this. So it's uh, totally easy uh, for you know, people to paint anything they want. Uh, if you don't want it to look blocky, because now it looks kind of like you know, uh, Minecraft style, let's switch it to like more Mario style so that slopes uh, emerge here. And again, no sprite selecting, no anything like that. You just select the option and uh, go ahead and draw it. You can have different terrains here. Uh, you want a player? Here you go a player and a bank. Here I go, already running here. Uh, maybe some pickups to pick up. All right, let's put some pickups. Uh, maybe I need an enemy here. Right, uh, enemy, let's put this nasty guy. I need to buy him for a couple of coin. And here we go, this guy. When he sees me, he's gonna charge at me. So uh, uh, that's kind of, you know, uh, uh, tricky situation to avoid him, but he fell down, now I'm safe. Uh, and this way, adding uh, stuff, as you can see, there is uh, a lot of stuff to be had, uh, like you can also uh, put stuff that is movable during the game, I'm now using my finger to uh, move this uh, stuff, rotating s or adding new you know, uh, checkpoints along the road, of, um, this is pretty easy, uh, and that's it, there are no more options or no more, you know, uh, hidden uh, uh, controls. That's all that the player gets. And he can create a game like this. I'm just only going to show you uh, how uh, a game can look created this way. Uh, and as you probably, uh, sorry, I just said I want to see uh, the advert. Uh, as you probably saw, there are various uh, visual teams just to show you what the difference they, they make. They change everything. It's not only about backgrounds, because it's about everything changing uh, its uh, shape, color, and work. Look, the enemies look totally different. So with the skin, everything uh, changes. And uh, what can you do if you got... So in a five minutes, you can have a totally playable Angry Birds style level or simple platformer level. But you have some more time uh, to spare. You can create some, uh, you know, really nice, uh, really great levels. This one is inspired by Indiana Jones, uh, with no hassle. And that's what you are trying to bring to people. You know, the fun of creating games themselves at home. This took just a couple of hours uh, creating. Imagine doing the self in Unity, having no assets, or in whatever other engine. We love Unity, and we use Unity. But Unity is for developers, for guys like us. If I gave Unity to my little uh, nephew, he would just say, uh, come on, what, what do I do with this? Because it's not an engine for you know kids, 
for people who have no technical skills. Uh, and as you can see, uh, pretty big levels and games can be created. Not only platformers, all kind of logic games, uh, slingshot games, other games will be adding a lot of content along the way. And that's all for today. Thank you very much for staying here. Thanks.